Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. Writing is putting a picture in the other person's mind, putting a smell in their nose, putting a sound in their ear. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hello, and welcome once again to The Emmett Blackwell Show. Thank you so much for listening, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. On this episode, I'll be speaking with author Charles Peterson Shepard. We discuss his life leading up to becoming an author, how his work in teaching, corrections, and youth counseling has added to his writing, also what he has planned for the future. I will also quiz him on his classic rock knowledge, so stay tuned for that. So without any further ado, let's begin. Flint of Dreams by Charles Peterson Shepard when a young woman is assaulted and two young men murdered on the shores of Hemlock Lake in upstate New York, everybody knew that Asa Flint Spencer did it. He was an angry young Seneca Indian of the Blue Heron Clan with a troubled past, but they were all wrong. And the government researchers seeking remote viewers in the war on terrorism had their eyes on Flint as well. For Flint was born with special powers he did not fully understand. The secrets lay in the hearts and minds of an old Iroquois woman a sadistic, psychic assassin, and the NSA agents seeking to utilize Flint's unique abilities at all costs. For Flint, the missing pieces of the puzzle swirled in his primordial dreams. Get your copy of Flint of Dreams by Charles Peterson Shepard at Amazon.com. All right, and I am here with the author, Charles Peterson Shepard. And Charles, how are you doing today? I'm doing very fine. Thank you. So throughout your life, you have been a news writer, an editor, a Mm -hmm. scholar, a school teacher, a youth correctional counselor, and an adult parole agent, as well as an amateur graphic artist. You have a bachelor's degree in English literature and a master's Mm -hmm. degree in education. So throughout doing Mm -hmm. all these things in your life, why did you decide to start writing fiction? Well, I think I've been doing fiction pretty much all my life. When I was a little kid, man in bed with like my older siblings, they would, you know, say, Hey, uh, tell us a story, you know, before we go to sleep. Hmm. And I would start making up a story. I would take a story that I'd learned in class and I would elaborate on it. Just tell the story and try to satisfy people. But I first knew that I was, you know, a good writer in fifth grade because my teacher uh, told me, Hey, you know what? When I read your words, it's like you paint with your words. And I didn't know what she meant, but she said, hey, when you write, you every smell, every color, every sound, it's always there. And she really enjoyed reading it. And then in middle school, I was told that I had, you know, really good syntax, good ability to put words together in a, in a nice way. So I've always been doing that. I, I wrote fiction also in high school and college, but never formalized. I never really pursued, you know, writing a, what you would call a, a general work of fiction. Until I got into my, you know, early 40s, I began writing um, what eventually became Flint of Dreams as a correctional officer. And then I stopped writing that for a while to write The Specialist, which you are aware of, Mm -hmm. and then went back to finishing Flint of Dreams. So I would say that I've been writing pretty much all my life fiction. I love telling stories. I used to take um, the, the songs of the lyrics from songs and try to write stories from them or try to add on something to them. I was a very big fan of a rock band called Rush because Mm. I would listen to their lyrics, like 2112 or Farewell to Kings, and it was like a story that was told. And so I began to associate uh, writing with creating images in people's minds at a very young age. In other words, for me, writing is putting a picture in the other person's mind, putting a smell in their nose, putting a sound in their ear, and that's what writing is for me. Wow. And, and, and honestly, that's a great answer. <laughs> I, I don't mm-hmm. think I've really heard uh, that 
descriptive of an answer. And so I get your point about being able to put images into people's minds because you, you did that to me just now. Um, <laughs> so now you're currently <laughs> helping other authors get recognized. How are you doing that? Well, um, I just know from my own experience, having, you know, written a novel, having edited the novel, had the novel edited professionally, and then publishing it on, you know, Amazon as a independent author. You think that's the end of it. I've done it. I've written my masterpiece. I've, I've created that which I sought to do. Now everybody come and read it or purchase it and write reviews. Well, guess what? That doesn't often happen. Why? Well, because we live in an era now where everybody that's anybody can write a book, people that are extremely talented and some that are, you know, still developing their talents. So there's a glut of prose and literature out there and there's a glut of authors out there all promoting their, their words. I guess, you know, John Cougar Mellencamp put it best in a song called check it out where he said, there's a million voices screaming out their words to a world full of people living to be heard. And, I feel like that's what it's like for authors today. We're all out there. We all want to be read. We all want to be recognized. We all want people to notice us, but it's so difficult. And so for me, it's a pleasure, you know, to recognize that other people have skills, that other people are trying to do what I do, that other people are trying to get recognized and get their work out. And I find that there's a, there's a fulfilling feeling within me if I can help someone else achieve their dream, not just my own dream, but to see other people like-minded, like me, my author brothers and sisters, achieve as well. Because guaranteed, we're all not going to be the next Stephen King. We're all not going to be J.K. Rowling. But we all love to write. And that's what we need to celebrate, is the effort and the creativity of each of us. Not just me, you know? So I'm not about you know, hey, look at my stuff, look at my stuff, look at my stuff. Uh, I find that very tiring, and I think I would get very very quickly tired of someone who was always, always doing that. But what I have found is that by reaching out to other people, recognizing their effort, recognizing their novels, their writing, writing a review here and there, encouraging other people with graphic arts, it gives them a lift and enthuses them. It increases their, their proclivity to support other people, too. And I like to think of myself as kind of like the hub of a wheel. I want to be that hub that everybody comes to and everything flows through me with the help and the support and the giving. And then other people do it too. And then we have a community of writers, a community of people. And sometimes that's what you need because maybe nobody buys your book for a whole month. What are you going to do during that period? Mm -hmm. Just soak? No, I try to get out there and try to show people, you know, other people's work. And hopefully they'll share mine as well. And I find it's just been really productive. I've, it's such a wonderful community out there. You know, there, most writers are such feeling, kind, good people yeah. just trying to make it. And so, uh, you know, once you're in that community, it's just a really great feeling. And I've never been one to, you know, just promote myself. Maybe that's because, you know, like I said, I was a school teacher and I was a correctional counselor and I did work as a parole agent. And, you know, I think that that in me has just been extended. It's just evolved into my writing. So yeah. I like to do graphic arts, take, you know, something interesting that somebody's doing and present it in a different way. It pleases them. It, it catches the eye of others and it brings me pleasure. Wow, absolutely. And you know what, sir? You are a man of my own heart here. Um, this whole show was birthed out of that same concept. And I want to thank you so much because you're the type of person who gives me a lot of hope for people who are out there trying to make it, okay? People who take their stories and they put them out there and they might not get recognition right away. There's always somebody out there, somebody like you who might just read their story and say, you know what, this is a good book, not just because I see it on a Barnes & Noble shelf, not because I hear about it on TV, but because the story itself holds its own and it can be out there and be good, and the author is continually being good with the other stories that they're writing. So, I mean, what you're doing is amazing. And I've looked at your Twitter feed. I don't see a lot of your personal stuff. I see a lot of other people's stuff, which kind of makes me feel really good. And I'm sure it makes all those authors who you talk to feel amazing because somebody else likes their work. And um, I just want to thank you for doing stuff like that. That's, that's what keeps hope alive mm -hmm. in this world. 
Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I was going to tell you that um, I get feedback from the authors. So it's not like I'm doing it and I don't get, you know, something in return. What I get in return is, you know, that feeling of gratification, the feeling that, hey, somebody noticed my work and, you know, did you really like it? And, and everything that you just said. So I, I do get a pleasure out of doing that, recognizing other people's work. But I also think that it's a good marketing strategy as well. Mm-hmm. It's not completely selfless. You know, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Because what I find is when I do post something, I get lots of shares. When I do post something, I have a community of people that are dedicated to, you know, to me as well. They're like, hey, dude, I know you backed my play, so I'm going to back your play. I'm going to lift you up, you know, and we need to be lifting each other up. Mm-hmm. And I'm like you. I, I want to I wanna help other people get recognized. And in, and in turn, hopefully, people will see that in me take an interest in my writing. I'm kind of hoping that an author or two will actually read my book and tell somebody else about it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's working. So now you were a parole officer and a youth counselor. Um, Now that's a difficult job. What have you done in that field so far? Okay, well, I first began, uh, let me just say that I started my career as a public school teacher. I I went to UCLA, got an English degree, uh, got out of school, couldn't find a job. (laughs) <laughs> you know, so I said, what can I do? I ended up being a public school teacher. I worked for eight years. After eight years, I discovered that I was making only about 5% more than I was when I started. And so as a public school teacher, I wasn't getting paid that much, even in the state of California, comparatively speaking to, you know, some of my same age peers. Mm-hmm. And then what happened was I I saw an ad a flyer for uh, being for being a teacher at a correctional facility. Uh, that was part of the California Youth Authority at that time. And they made twice as much money doing the same thing. So I must say that, you know, when I first got into the correctional field of education, it was really more about my pocketbook than Mm -hmm. anything else. You know, they made safety money, they would call it. Mm -hmm. They made more money because they were going into an environment that was unsafe compared to a public school. And that motivated me. I said, I can do that. So I don't want you to think that I went in there saying I'm going to change the world. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that idea in mind. But once I got into the correctional education, what I realized was that the vast majority of people that are incarcerated, not all by any means, but the vast majority of them, especially those that are, you know, among minorities and low income, are also extremely uneducated. Mm. Now, what I mean by that is this. Are they are they slick? Yeah. Are they smart? Yes. Are they intelligent? Yes. Do they got street smarts? Yes. And could they hold an intelligent conversation with you? Yes. In fact, you could talk to many of them for long periods of time and get the impression that they're highly intelligent. Mm-hmm. What I discovered was that even though they could display these, you know, uh, intelligent, intelligent, they could they could display their intelligence in a conversation with you if you ask them to read something. Maybe they couldn't read. If you ask them to read and and then express what they had read or use that knowledge that was there before them, or if you placed knowledge in front of them through a computer or through a book and ask them to, you know, uh, build something with it, to, to synthesize that knowledge into something new, they don't have the capability to do that. And that's what people make money doing, mm-hmm. is taking the basic things and doing something more with it. So I discovered... In teaching that many people that are incarcerated don't have all the developmental educational skills that that they need to succeed, and then sometimes it can be quite shocking how how limited they are. But mm-hmm. you might not know that just from talking to them. Oh yeah, and and that's one thing that just it amazes me that um, especially uh, children and and people who are just kind of like in the adolescent stage, they're very smart, they're very intelligent. Um, we had a guest on here not too long ago talking about how some kids that they've encountered had emotional and behavioral um, disabilities that were basically restricting them from learning anything. And, you know, you look into the correction side of things, and some of those kids that, that get into a lot of trouble had the same kind of issues that some kids in some classrooms get into. It's just in some situations they get arrested or they get into a lot of trouble and they're still smart. They just need to know where to apply that information, you know? 
I would also like to add that, you know, working in corrections had another effect upon me, and that is that when I was a public school teacher, I had the I had the mindset that, hey, if I work with somebody closely and and, and encourage them and really push them and and really be positive, that they too will, you know, take that in and try to be positive and try to do something really positive with it. And once I joined in corrections, I had to kind of change my thinking a little bit, Emmett, because I had to realize, yeah, there are some people here who want to make that positive change and who want to do something very, very different with their lives and given an opportunity would. But yet there are also some people who are dyed in the wood manipulators, Mm -hmm. dyed in the wool, uh, you know, cheats, liars, thieves. They're not going to change. That doesn't mean you don't give them those services and that you don't expose them as much as you possibly can. But what I did learn was that not everybody is, you know, going to take those opportunities and use them and be positive. But you as a as a correctional worker or myself as a correctional worker, the positive is when I find that that receptacle, that that person who is willing to change. That's what I put my energy into those guys. Yeah, exactly. The other ones, I'm just the other ones. I'm just gonna, you know, watch them very carefully, make sure they don't hurt me and hurt others, and make sure I get home safe. But even in that group, there's always those people that want to change their lives. Or if you have the right approach, you can spark an interest in them. And I know that I was able to do that because, you know, I would teach classes in my correctional facility, you know, for a month, and you know, I would be so stressed out. Every day, because there's always acting out. There's always cussing and swearing. There's always somebody trying to play you. There's always somebody trying to do this or that. But let me go away for a day or two. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And have a substitute there who doesn't give a damn. Mm -hmm. Well, when I come back, I know by their reaction that, hey, I'm having a positive effect on these guys. Oh, yeah. You know, because they're... Because then they're cussing and swearing about how they didn't learn nothing <laughs> you know, for the last two days. And that person didn't do nothing and they didn't care. But we know you care, you know. So I know that, you know, that was a real positive thing. Then after I was an educator, I got into the correctional counselor field. And that was when I was working up on a living unit where they're locked up. And that's a totally different um, it's a totally different feel because when you're in education as a teacher, you're, you're giving them something. You're giving them a positive. You're giving them time out of their room. You're giving them positive feedback. You're giving them knowledge, something they can use, you know, things that they can take with them. But when you're working up on a correctional facility, you're taking things away because you're mm-hmm. putting them in their room and you're denying them the basic privileges that they forfeited when they committed their, their offenses. So there's a different feeling. You know what I mean? Like, uh, as a teacher, I felt like I'm helping these guys. I can get to them. I can reach them. But when I was working up in the correctional facility inside, in the living unit, it was much more of a mm, us against them type of a feeling. Mm. But one, of, but one of the things I learned a lot from was listening to them. Mm. You know, listening to them down the bank, listening to them talk, listening to them chirp back and forth listening to their language, listening to their slang, the meanings of it, what was meaningful to them. From that, I developed a different type of mindset for myself in dealing with people. I realized, wow, this is a whole different subculture. Yeah. And actually, I mean, that kind of flows right into your book, Flint of Dreams. I mean, you can see it within the first few pages. It flows perfectly into that story. Now, in your book, Flint of Dreams, you incorporate the Seneca Indians. Now, what connection do you have with that tribe and and what inspired you to write that book? Okay. Uh, Well, let me just say that, you know, I'm not a Seneca Indian, obviously, but um, as a young kid, African-American kid growing up in upstate New York, I grew up in a very small town that was predominantly Caucasian and my family and perhaps another family or two were the only African American, you know, group in that whole area. Mm -hmm. So in my, in my class growing up first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, I might be the only black kid in the whole class Mm -hmm. all the way up to, you know, high school. That, that was the setting. So I had an understanding of what it's like to be different and isolated from other people, even though you are accepted and treated the same by others. They can't control how you view yourself. Mm -hmm. And when I got in seventh grade, I had a seventh grade teacher by the name of Mr. Hendrickson. And he was going to be teaching us the history of New York State. And the first thing he said was, you know, 
do you know what it's like to be different in a land where everybody's different from you and they have all the power? And boy, did I really understand that. <laughs> and the first word that he wrote on the board was SCOOM, S-C-O-O-M. And he said, before we learn anything else about New York, we're going to learn what this word stands for. And what SCOOM, S-C-O-O-M, stood for was the five tribes of the Iroquois nation that resided in New York before the coming of the Europeans. S stood for Seneca. The C stood for the Cayuga. The O stood for Oneida. The second O stood for the Onondaga. And the last letter, M, stood for the Mohawk. And the, those five tribes ruled the state of New York as a league of tribes, five tribes together. Those on the far east, the Mohawk, were known as the east, the keepers of the eastern gate. And those on the western side of New York, the Seneca, were known as the keepers of the western gate. And from that, that moment is when I first learned a little bit about the Seneca Indians, a little, little bit about the tribes. Up until that time, I believed that all the tribes lived in tents and teepees. Mm -hmm. They didn't. You know, the, the Northeastern Indians lived in a thing called the Long House, and the Long House was not only their home, but it was also like their clan setting. So different clans lived in different Long Houses. And I also learned that at one time, they were totally into, you know, the nature religion, that, you know, all things were connected to nature. With the coming of the Europeans, much of that was destroyed or compromised with Christianity and the conquerings. Mm -hmm. And but what came out of that later in it was that uh, the Indians decided among themselves, we need a religion that that holds our people together in the midst of all this. And what came out of that was the Longhouse religion. And the Seneca tribe was one of the leaders of the development of the Longhouse religion. I learned all that like when I was in middle school. And I was always very, very fascinated with Native, Native American culture. And I just started studying it a great deal. So 30 years later, when I decided to write the book of Flint of Dreams, initially I thought I can write about myself because I was, you know, an isolated black kid growing up in a small little town. But I decided, no, I don't want to do that. I want to write about a different culture as well. And so I decided, you know what, if I take a Seneca kid who went through the same things, um, felt all that frustration, started committing crimes and doing bad things, then I can make the connection of the cultural people of the Longhouse with the criminal thinking behaviors that I was familiar with through working with corrections. And I can instill that all in one single character. Wow. And that was the brilliant idea that I that came to me and said, you know what, I can do it all with this one character. I can talk about the Native American people. I can talk about the Longhouse religion. I can talk about the history. I can also talk about the criminal thinking behaviors and the criminal thinking errors that I saw while working in corrections. And it will be a wonderful idea for that person to do what we want everybody to be able to do, and that's turn it around. Mm -hmm. I, wanted him, I wanted him to turn it around, not only in his criminal thinking behaviors, but also turn it around in the way that he viewed himself as a Seneca Indian, and also how he viewed the religion of his people. It's not something that was foreign, but something that's real. And so I decided to write the book as if what they believed in the Longhouse religion is real. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why I decided to write that book. I wanted to tell the story of an isolated kid with criminal thinking behaviors who doesn't use Christianity as a means to turn himself around, but rather uses his Native American uh, culture and his Native American spiritism to turn his life around. Wow. I, I tell you what, just the premise of the entire story alone um, for one, it's going to make your readers walk away wanting to know more. And and just now, when you explained to me um, the different types of like the longhouse religion and things like that, I would have never guessed. Um, I, I can guess now why you're such an amazing teacher. Uh, <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. yeah, all those Thank things, I didn't realize that there was so much involved in that. I mean, it's it's really incredible the amount of research that you've done um, on this book and the fact that you can pull yeah. parallels to your own personal life and this story and these characters 
years, it's incredible. It really is. If I just did research and tried to write it, it would be different than if I'm writing from inside of me as well. And so the challenge was, yes, I want to incorporate all those factual things, but I want to make it live and I want to paint pictures and I want to pull the person in and I want them to feel what he's feeling. Mm-hmm. And that was the challenge. Yeah. So now in Flint of Dreams, you also have a very unique antagonist. Now tell us about this character. Okay. Uh, you know, the hero's name is uh, Flint Spencer. Mm. And I think that, you know, every good book has got to have a good antagonist. The better the villain, the better the, you know, the better the hero, I guess they mm. say. So what I wanted to do was have a, a character who, like Flint Spencer, had a Native American background. Who, like Flint Spencer, knew what it was to be isolated. And who, like Flint Spencer, had been exposed to the criminal element. But I wanted this character to be the one who chose a negative path. And in this character, I wanted him to be more of a an evil person, mm-hmm. bent on doing evil. And so I created the character known as Esso Breezy. And Esso Breezy was uh, a young boy that was born in an Esso gas station in upstate New York. He was deserted there by his mother. And then he was raised, you know, by a Pakistani family who were street performers. And as a little kid, they took note that he was able to read people's minds and do little mind tricks. And then as he grew older and older, growing up in the neighborhood that he did, he became much more involved in crime, became involved with the East Coast Mafia. Uh, Also, he became involved with different triad type gangs in the city of Toronto. And through that, in his own personal decisions, he becomes an evil person. And he has the ability to use his psychic powers to travel to different places, travel into people's minds. So he's a very special type of evil assassin who can you know, travel through the mind and enter into your dreams through power. And in the book, there is a, a drug that is developed by, you know, uh, the powers that be, so to speak, let's say, you know, NSA, CIA types mm-hmm. that increases that power. But it's also highly addictive. So through that, I use the concept of someone having a power, but also taking an addictive drug. And I equate, you know, the drug, which I call in the book Clara Verizon, which is a combination of clairvoyance and seeing to the next horizon. Hence, Clara Verizon. Mm -hmm. Uh, I equate that with like a meth type of a drug Mm -hmm. that the more you take it, the, the more power it gives you, the more power it gives you, the more you take until it's taking complete control of you. And that's the nature of that character. And also, that character is in touch with the evil side of Native American spiritism. Because as I'm sure you're aware, in almost every type of religion, there's the the bright side of the religion, the bright side of the spiritism, and there's also a dark side that you can go to. Mm -hmm. And he chooses to go to the dark side. It's a very familiar theme, Mm -hmm. you know, good versus evil. He chooses the dark side, so to speak. Wow, that's incredible. You have so much going on in this one book. I mean, you have like this this um culture clash and and within the same culture you have the the light side and the dark side. You also kind of have like this government conspiracy undertone going on with the the drug manipulation and and things like that. It really it, it pulls everybody in so many different directions that if you don't find yourself in this book and I'm talking to the people that are listening, if you don't find yourself somewhere in this book, um, it would be a hard thing to to believe because at some point you're going to run into something that either you've experienced or you know somebody who's experienced it or you can relate. And and that's the most incredible thing about this is that you have relatable characters because anybody can turn their life around if they try hard enough, if they're if they're willing to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then again, there's some people who can just fall right off the wayside and they aren't redeemable. You know, they won't come back. So it's it's very right. – it's a challenge, you know, for anybody to kind of go up against uh, good versus evil. But this is so much more than that. This is uh, cultural clashes and things like that. It's a really incredible book. Now, you came from a very large family, okay? You're you're the eleventh of twelve children. Um, do you ever find that yes. that um that you kind of inspire your other family members? Well, you know, what I wanted to say is that you know. Uh, 
I was the eleventh of twelve. So when I was coming up, you know, my mom died at a very early age. I was about thirteen years old when she passed away. My dad, you know, took off and married some other lady. So in my situation as a young teenager, I was kind of lost. I was very fortunate in having a sister of mine, uh, Lois, who adopted me as her own and brought me into her home. She was my older sister by about 13 years. Mm. And she's the one who took me to California and totally changed my life. Because up until that time, you know, when I was in junior high school, you know, me and my friends, we did all the things that kids probably shouldn't do at times. You know, we did the drinking and the smoking and the, you know, uh, experimenting with marijuana and such. And after my mom died when I was about 14 years old, I really sank deep into that type of, you know, uh, thinking error that I could somehow, so, you know, self-medicate myself from the sorrow mm-hmm. and the frustration of losing my mom. So for a while, I really uh, had a real negative experience as far as, you know, coming up as a kid. But my older siblings are the ones who provided me in in many cases with inspiration, uh, financial support, roof over my head, encouraged me to go to college, you know, helped me through school. I can probably tell you that at some point when I was going through going to UCLA, you know, every single one of my older brothers, be it my older sister, Tracy, my older brother, Arthur, my my older sister, Lois, my brother, Philip, um, my sister, Hattie, all of them offered some type of encouragement to me as an elder sibling to a younger sibling to get me through that. You know, so when I graduated from UCLA at the ripe age of 22, I can look back at my family and realize that, you know what, I wouldn't have done this without, you know, their help. And I really appreciate that. And now here it is, you know, 30 years later. And I can honestly say that, you know, we're not like really super competitive amongst our family. Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate, Emmett, because when in my family of 12, I look at it as like kind of like three groups of four. The first four were all very close in age. And then there's a middle four. And in each case, the older four and the middle four, there's like two brothers and two sisters and a set of twins. And in the second four, two brothers, two sisters, and a set of twins. So I would imagine that there might have been a lot of competition and tit for tat among them. But in the in the lower four, which I'm a part of, I had three sisters, and I was the only brother. And you know, my next elder brother was five or six five or six years older than me. So I never had the feeling of like being in a competitive situation. I always had the feeling of like uh, being in a nurturing situation around my sisters. Don't get me wrong. We fought, you know, and punched and did all that stuff that kids do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Well, I got siblings, too. I know. <laughs> right. But as I got older, you know, I, I can honestly say that, you know, there's no competition. You know, we just take pride in each other's achievements or we try to. And, and if something unfortunate does occur, you know, <laughs> Hey, you know, hopefully we'll get past it and move on beyond it. I'm not going to let it, I'm not going to let any competition between my siblings determine who I am or how I treat people in my world. You know what I mean? I'm just going to think about the good things that they did for me. Yeah. And, and the good things I can do for others. And actually, you know what, Charles, the, the most incredible thing about this is the fact that the way that, that you almost took that leap to not being somebody who could be coming back and being redeemed, um, you are now, or, or you did, in your correction field, help so many people who were either on that edge or who, even even after everybody had given up hope, you were still trying to help. You know, I mean, and honestly, being raised the, the way that you were, um, did you ever find yourself kind of thinking when you go back after going through all these corrections and say, you know, my life could have turned out a lot worse than what it did? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, when I think about, you know, my life, the thing I think about is, hey, I could have been a drug addict. I could have been, you know, uh, I could have gone to prison. I could have uh, made all the mistakes that other people made. Why? Because uh, I'm human and I have my human foibles and I have my human weaknesses. And in some in certain times, I was put in situations where I had to make certain choices. I'm just glad to say that, you know, despite, you know, the shortcomings of my parents and the shortcomings of my siblings, I was instilled with, you know, some goodness, some type of ability to choose right 
in most situations. But I never look at other people and try to judge them and say, you know, I, I, I'm better than you, or mm. I would never have done that. I would never be in your situation. No, I, I know that's not true at all. You know what I mean? And I've met so many young people in corrections where I'd met them and I'd work with them and I'd, and I'd say to myself, what the heck are you doing here? Mm -hmm. You don't belong. You don't, why are you here? You mm -hmm. know, because they had so many positive qualities that I could see, but they just made bad decisions. You know, we've all made bad decisions. I mean, to be honest with you, if I were to tell you, you know, you know, some of the things I did in junior high school and high school, I can honestly say it's a wonder I didn't get locked up mm -hmm. or I didn't get hurt or I didn't get maimed. So I understand that when you're young, you make a lot of foolish decisions, the kind of decisions that, that you know, can negatively affect your life. It doesn't mean you're not a good person, though. It doesn't mean you don't have a good heart. It doesn't mean that there's not a lot of good in you and there's not something that can be redeemed. You'd be surprised you know, the positive effect you can have on people with a kind word, a word of encouragement, you know, tell them, hey, keep trying, don't give up. A lot of people that are locked up or in a correctional setting never heard those words. You would think they did, but in some cases, they never did. No one ever pulled them to the side and encouraged them. And not to overtalk it, but one of the things I've learned as a correctional officer is that people often live up to your expectations of them. So if you expect them to fail, they'll be more than happy to live up to that expectation. Yeah, exactly. Because that's, that's, that's what you put out there. That's what you put in the universe. It's kind of like, you know, with me, with authors, I, I try to, you know, my thing is I try to encourage them to keep doing what they're doing. I don't try to be too negative. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I know that the positive goes a lot further than the negative. Oh, yeah. Being positive is so much more powerful. It really is. And that's, that's the message I want to get across to readers, writers, authors is, you know, keep your positive attitude and share that positivity with other people. That's what's going to make the world a better place. Wow. Exactly. Exactly. Now, on your Twitter page, I got to talk about this, okay? <laughs> I was looking through mm -hmm. your Twitter page last night and a couple of nights ago, and I, I saw this thing called the Ant Lords. Now, you have to understand, I'm a humongous sci-fi buff, all right? I like horror. I like fiction. I like all kinds of stuff like that. I get geeked about all this stuff. So I see this Ant Lords thing. What is this story all about? Is this some kind of sci-fi thing you got coming up? Yes. Uh, first of all, I was going to tell you, when you were saying, hey, I'm into all that stuff, guess what? I'm into all that stuff, too. All right, yeah. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? So I love all that, you know, sci-fi stuff. But the thing that I recall, you know, the most as a little kid was my fascination with, you know, the miniature world mm -hmm. of, you know, ants and little bugs and little creatures. And I think about the hours I would spend you know, watching ants, watching small creatures. So I'm going to, I'm going to do something I hadn't planned to do. I'm going to just tell you very briefly what the concept is behind this book called the ant Lords. And I'm going to say this, I believe in my own little sci-fi brain that throughout the galaxy that we live in, wherever life can take place, it will sprout. In other words, if the conditions are right in a certain planet for life to occur, it will. And it is life's proclivity, it is life's characteristic to always become increasingly more complex and more intelligent. And depending on the environment, different types of animal types will rise to a higher level of intelligence given a certain environment. In other words, there may be an all-water planet out there where the smartest creatures on that planet are octopuses and they're super <laughs> yeah. smart yeah they are maybe maybe you've seen them in some science fiction movies that look uh maybe perhaps in some other place there's a bunch of lizard creatures maybe you've heard of the reptilians oh yeah oh definitely <laughs> visit our planet i believe that's a possibility i'm trying to get so one on the show possible. currently but yeah no <laughs> go ahead right so i believe that like in the history of earth's life development there have been different eras where different types of creatures have dominated. There was once a time when, you know, we're living in the era where mammals dominate. There was once a time when, you know, amphibians dominated. There was once a time when the fishes dominated. Well, there was also once a time when insects dominated Earth. So I try to take the that to another level and say, hey, you know what? Perhaps there's some place out there where, you know, small ant-like creatures developed into 
super intelligent creatures as well. Why not? What's to stop it from happening? Nothing. Given the right conditions, the right situation, why not? Why couldn't it happen? Mm -hmm. What if no other, you know, what if insect life was the the highest level of development on a planet and there were no predators that could take them down? Well, they would just develop into super intelligent insectoid-like creatures just as smart as us. Mm -hmm. So the ant lords uh, takes that notion and thinks, well, what if they develop the, the ability to you know, travel through space, do space travel the way we want to? They did it maybe millions of years ago, mm -hmm. maybe a billion years ago. Who knows? But the point is, what if they did? What if they came to Earth? What would they make of us? Because as humans, we tend to think that we're all that. Mm -hmm. and that mammals are like the highest level of development. And if we went to a planet and there was a bunch of tiny little bugs running around, we would treat those bugs like vermin. Mm -hmm. Well, it's quite possible that if insectoids came to our planet, they wouldn't look at us as intelligent. They might look at us as some form of vermin. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah. And, you know, the funny so, thing is, with this whole concept that you have, you, you think about it, right? Insects have defense mechanisms. They have exoskeletons. They have... Um, the abilities to mass reproduce, um, just those things alone, if they were extremely intellectual, they could take over entire planets. And that really is an amazing idea. Well, thank you. I'm glad you, you like it. I don't want to say anything more because I'm still writing it. But the point is that, you know, I want to do that. But in the same way that I took, you know, human characters and, and gave them, uh, you know, heart gave them mind soul in front of dreams i want to still be able to take that concept that science fiction concept with all of its science fictiony kind of stuff <laughs> but still tell a human story about feelings about growth about development i still want the reader to to be a part of everything you know i want them to see I don't want to just tell them it's, you know, it's, it's raining. I want them to feel the rain hitting, hear the rain hitting the window, see it running down the glass pane, be in the mind of different creatures, be in the mind of different people, and just kind of like make it a, a, a beautiful story that somebody can get caught up into, not just a science fiction, you know, like, I don't want to write this, the pulp type of a story. Mm -hmm. I want to write something that's a little bit higher, a little bit more intellectual, a little bit more emotional. And it's going to be about that culture, their culture, and how it might clash with our culture and how it might interact in some way. And hopefully how both species can somehow survive. Wow, that's that's an incredible story. You, you're going to have to do like three or four books of this. You realize that, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> to get all that in? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a lot of stuff to really yeah. think about. Um, so now you've been writing for a while and you've been – in the fields that most writers kind of emulate in their books, okay? They they haven't been in that mm -hmm. field, but they try to emulate it. But you've been in yeah. those fields. Now, what advice mm -hmm. would you give a new author who's just getting started? Well, uh, my, my advice, which I give to all authors, you know, is if you're going to write a book, write your roadmap, draw your map where you want the character to be at the end of your story. To me, that's the most important thing. And I think I don't have any problem with somebody sitting down and starting to write a novel and just see where it goes. If that's where you do it, great. But I think that, you know, if I was going to tell a new writer or a new author how to get started, I would say, hey, look, you got to have a roadmap. You have to have a starting point for your characters and you have to have an end point for your characters. You have to, you have to know where you want them to be at the end of that story. Now, my philosophy is roadmap with side trips. So once you have your mm -hmm. roadmap and you know where they want to be, it's quite all right for you to go on a side trip or go on a side story or develop another character or, you know, another interesting uh, angle to look at. As long as you keep your roadmap in mind and you have all the key locations that you want to stop at. So if you're traveling across America and you start off in Florida and you're going to go all the way to Washington or you might want to stop at Disney World. Mm -hmm. You might want to stop at some place in Georgia. You might want to stop at the Grand Canyon. You want to swing right and go someplace else until finally you hit the Pacific Northwest. But you want those places that you want them to see. 
and all the other stuff that happens is like still and 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 it's more like magic because it's off to the side but you still have your path so i say roadmap know where you're going to go but don't be afraid to you know go off onto the side as long as you get back to your main story that's you know in the writing process as far as you know when you're done with the writing process uh the most important thing a, a writer has to do that I learned from my own experience is edit. Mm. You got to have another pair of eyes look at your work. You cannot edit your own work as an author because A, you're exhausted. B, you tend to miss things, mm -hmm. especially when it's your own writing. You have a tendency to skip over because you know it so well. Mm -hmm. So you want to get edited. Also, I, I would say for a new author, uh, one of the most important things for them to do is to pre-market their mm, book. Yeah. Most writers, the mistake they make is they write their book, they get it done, and then they say, now i got to market it. I say, no, you should be marketing your book on social media all along the way as you're writing it. Hey, I'm coming out with a book in six months. This mm. is what it's about. That's a really and good idea. little hints and little stories, little ideas, you know what I mean? So that people know that it's coming out. And you should be networking with authors and trying to meet authors even as you're writing. If you write a couple chapters, post them no harm, and have people look at it, share it, you know, and you'll get some feedback from different people and they'll help you and you'll become known so that when you finally announce your book, you will have a network of authors and readers who already know who you are and they're happy. They've been looking for that book. And even if they're not going to go out and buy it, they're more than happy to to help you promote it because you were helping them promote their stuff along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I say pre-plan, you know, I, I say roadmap, side trips, pre-plan, and pre-market. Wow. That's the most important thing. Yeah, exactly. That's great advice. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have... Thank you. We've, we've come to the section now of the show where I uh, ask you to participate in a quiz. Now, we have a very special type of quiz for you. Now, we know that you mm -hmm. are a... Um, uh, a classic rock kind of fan. But what we're going to do for mm -hmm. this is a sophisticated rock quiz. And by sophisticated, I mean... I'm going to use synonyms to describe a title of a classic rock song, and, and you will have to okay. come up with the title of that song. So are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm a rock aficionado, and I think <laughs> I'm going to ace this quiz. <laughs> exactly. Now, here's the, here's the uh, kicker. Each, each question is worth 1,000 points. You will be able to redeem yourself at the end for an additional 2 trillion points, which then will clear the board and you'll win the game. All right? So Okay, cool. Here we go. Title number one. Another mortar and concrete pressed block in the partition. What is the title of that song? That's Pink Floyd, 1980, Another Brick in the Wall. Yes, correct. All right. All right, here we go. The next one. Extinguished fire remnants upon the liquid H2O. Ashes. Smoke on the water. Yes, it is. Oh. Correct. <laughs> All right. Here's the next one. Man, you're doing really good so far. I, I'm really excited about this. Okay. All right. Here two we go. Two. Yeah, two for two. All right. Here we go. We remain the title holders. We are the champions. Wow. Queen. <laughs> yes. Three for three. Correct. All right. Here's another one. This one might be a little bit tricky. Inclined ascension device reaching toward the clouds. Come on, dude. Don't insult me. This is like 1973 Led Zeppelin. Stairway no, to Heaven. No, no. Oh, I'm trying so hard. These questions aren't hard enough. All right. You know, and the, the listeners are probably sitting there on the edge of their seat just like, I can't answer that. I can't. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here's the no. next one. Here's the next one. I just think you're really good at this. So here's the next one. Thanks. You, you are undefeated at this point, sir. All right. Mm -hmm. United States female human. Tom Petty, American girl. No, very close. Very close. It, no. was, it was American woman. I'll, I'll give you the point. All right. It wasn't Tom Petty, but it's an American woman. Um, okay. Here, here's the next one. So you're still undefeated. Okay, Don't. cool. I'll take that. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Don't distress at the sight of the harvester. Okay, that is uh, mid-70s. That's uh, Blue Oyster Cult. 
Don't fear the reaper. Yes, correct. I can hear that cowbell now. All right. <laughs> All right. All right, here we go. More cowbell, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next one. Riders on the Squall. This one. This one's a giveaway. That's the doors. Riders on the storm. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Correct. Thank you. All right, here we go for the next question. Who might cease the liquid cloud droppings? Okay, that is uh, Cretan's Clearwater Revival. We'll stop the rain. Yes, man. You're really good at this. Uh, man, are you hey. just like looking these things off? Yeah, no. <laughs> I just think you got to be right. Okay. It. All right, here we go. The next one. Moving at a very quick pace with Lucifer. Okay, this is 1980. No, 1978. Van Halen 1, Running with the Devil. Yes, it is. Man, I don't even think we need a bonus question, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. Because, so, cause, I mean, you've got like 9,000 points already on top of this thing. You have, I think, beaten everybody on this show as far as questions correct so very good job here's the bonus question Thanks. for two trillion points okay liberated follow okay that's uh 1973 leonard skinnard free bird yes it is yeah that is correct all right so mm-hmm. congratulations you won the game with uh two trillion nine thousand points um, the highest record we've had on this show, and um, one of the most interesting people we've had on the show in total so far. So I want to thank you so much for thank being you. on the Emmett Blackwell show, um, Charles. It was an incredible experience. You are an incredible person. Um, I want to thank you. Thank you so much uh, for all those kids out there, mm-hmm. all those people out there who whose lives you've touched, and what thank you're you. doing right now, writing fiction is probably just as just as passionate as what you were doing when you were helping other people you continue to help other people and i I think that it's amazing what you're doing so keep it up thank you thank you now where can people find your book okay i'm on amazon uh also you can get it on um, ibooks and also on barnes and noble as a as an ebook also on Amazon, you can also purchase it as a paperback as well. I, I published it through KDP, and they make the paperback and the ebook on Amazon. And of course, it's it, it's available on several different, uh, you know, ebook vendors, but primarily iBooks and Barnes and Noble. Also, Kobo. Oh yeah, Kobo. I've I've been hearing a lot about that lately, and I, I hear it's a really good platform. Um, but thank yeah, you. It's great. Yeah, thank you so much for being here on the show. It was an amazing experience, sir. Thank you. All right. And this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. Writing is putting a picture in the other person's mind, putting a smell in their nose, putting a sound in their ear. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. 